don't want to change things up on us today. We we'll look at something different. So if we can just turn to Matthew chapter 22. We'll just read a scripture to get our thoughts going. <laughs> Matthew 22 and verse 29. If you're not familiar here, the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection were trying to get Jesus in a, a gotcha moment, if you will, with, about the woman who had been married multiple times and who's, who's, who, why she would be in the resurrection. And Jesus begins his answer here in verse 29. says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Amen. If you remember last week, I mentioned a, a study that's done every, it's done every two years. It's called the State of Theology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they just finished up this year's, but they haven't released the results yet. But I was reading through the ones from 2022, and some of the things we believe as Americans is troubling. So I want us to look at some of these things and why they are why we should have a right view of them. Mm -hmm. so this survey, study, whichever you want to call it, it consists of both professing Christians and non-believers as well, which makes it even more troubling that professing Christians are, are part of this because it shows a pretty poor state of God's people today. Mm -hmm. There's four subjects that I broke this down into, but as I began studying, I realized we're going to do this in two parts. But I want us to look at what man believes, or what Americans, I guess I should say, believe regarding God, regarding sin, regarding the church and worship, and regarding the Bible. Mm. We'll look today, Lord willing, at what they believe regarding God and sin. And next time we continue this, we'll look at the other two. But I thought this scripture was fitting that Americans today, we, generally speaking, we err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. That you know, American Christianity, using that term very loosely, is knows very little about God and the Bible. Right. Our first statistic here is that 52% of Americans believe God learns and adapts to different circumstances. Mm. We, well, we might say, well, why is that right or wrong? And it is certainly not in line with the God of the Bible. You're right. I'm not going to turn there. I think we all know Malachi 3, 6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, God does not need to learn and observe or learn and adapt, if you will. He, That's right. Really, a God that is ever changing is not much of a God that can be trusted in. There you go. James 1 and 17 says, With him there is no variableness, there's no, no variance, no fickleness with God. He's not one that's subject to change. But man very is very fickle, though, isn't he? That's it. I think that's where a lot of people get off of it because man is so fickle to think God must be as well. But God is not like man is. But with him there is no said variables, neither shadow of turning is what James says. Mm -hmm. That he is an unchanging God is really something that we can take great assurance in as his people. Yeah. Yeah. That he doesn't promise one thing one day and then change the next day. He doesn't you know, hate this sin one day and hate this other sin another day. He doesn't love us one day and not love us the next day. Our God is an unchanging God. In fact, back in Malachi 3, 6, where I quoted the end part of that verse, it says, Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Amen. If God was a, a changing God, he would probably consume us all, wouldn't he? That's it. We see over and over again in the scriptures how man and even God's people particularly 
incite his anger. And his, a few times he was ready to just wipe out the nation of Israel to start over. I'm sure sometimes he has felt the same way about us as modern day Christians. If it had not been for Christ, he would have no doubt he wiped us all out already. Another reason why God doesn't learn and adapt to certain the situations is because he already knows these situations. Amen. I'll turn to Isaiah 46 for reading here. I'll be we'll be in a lot of scripture turning and I'll kind of quote what I can remember. But Isaiah chapter 46 verses 9 through 10. declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Amen. In verse 11 also it says, Yea, I have spoken it, and then part of that, Yea, I have spoken it, and I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, and I will also do it. Amen. See, God has already declared the end from the beginning. He's already mm -hmm. knows what's going to happen tomorrow, next year, and the Lord willing, 100 years from now, we're still here. He doesn't need to learn and adapt to these different things. It's not taken by <coughs> surprise that when things go on in this world. Amen. I won't turn there, but just for your extra knowledge, First John 3, 20 tells us God knows all things. That's it. Amen. Him knowing all things, he doesn't need to learn and adapt. There you go. God was not taken by surprise when Biden won the election. That's right. I would say that even he purposed it to be so. You're right. You know, we had lots of these quote prophets that said, oh, Trump's going to win again. Uh, we know they weren't prophets of God. But it wasn't that they got the wrong message. It wasn't that God told them the wrong message. It's that they are Really false prophets and liars. You're right. Not already <clears throat> Amen. Exactly what would happen. Sometimes that's hard for us to understand, I think, especially those who don't know God. It's hard for them to comprehend that God is in control of all things, even when evil abounds around us. Amen. He is still very much in control of ordering the affairs of this world. We know in the end he will destroy all the wicked and create a new heaven and a new earth. But he can be sure he's still very much in control. He's not a spectator in the sky. Amen. Uh, as one of us who needs to, to learn and to change our game plan. <laughs> Christ was as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. We Amen. make sure that he already knows even the sins which the world was going to commit. Mm -hmm. The next point I want us to look at is it says that it says that fifty five percent of Americans believe that Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. Mm -hmm. Now to some that might not sound like a terrible thing, but you realize what it is saying, then we're, you're saying that Jesus is not God. That's it. I just want to look at one scripture regarding that, because the, the next point kind of leads into that too. Colossians chapter 1. You know, this is exactly what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. Right. The Mormons and really kind of believe the same type of thing. Colossians chapter 1, uh, we'll just look at verses 16 and 17. If I can get there. Here he has been describing the Lord Jesus Christ. 
his dear son, as he's called him, at the end of verse 13. Verse 14 tells us that it's in him that we have the redemption and forgiveness of sins. Verse 15 tells us that he is the image of the invisible God. So verse 16, it says, For by him, that is Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Amen. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Mm hmm. Jesus cannot be a created being when he is the creator himself. That's it. Well, it so it leads into this next point that 53% of Americans believe that Jesus was a great teacher but was not God. Mm -hmm. You know, when you believe he was not God, then logically you're you coming to the conclusion that he is a created being. That's it. But John chapter 1 tells us very clearly that he is God. I'm sure we all know that, but I'll turn in there and read it for us. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. It was verse 3, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Amen. Here we see Christ as the Creator, God again. And verse 14 just confirms that it was Jesus. It says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. And Jesus has always been God in the beginning. Was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I don't know if it needs to get any more plain than that. We see really all throughout the Gospel of John that Christ is presented as as God. Mm -hmm. You don't have to turn there, but in John chapter 8, verse 58, talking to the Pharisees, and he said, Before Abraham was, I am. Amen. That Jesus there he equates himself to the great I am, which is the title that how God introduced himself to Moses, I am that I am. Mm -hmm. The Jesus is on the same level, if you will, as God the Father. Mm -hmm. well, I don't want to attempt to try to ex explain how the Trinity works exactly, but we know that God is three persons in one. Mm -hmm. well, there's a little diagram I've seen. It says, the Son is God, but the Son is not the Father. The Father is God, but he is not the Son. And the Holy Spirit is God, but he's not either one of those. And that sometimes hard for us to comprehend, I think, in our finite minds. We get right. God is one, and yet he is three persons in one. John chapter 20, verse 28. I won't turn over there, but if you're familiar with that area of Scripture, Jesus had been resurrected, and he came to the twelve, or the, I guess the eleven at that point. And Thomas, he, he wasn't so sure about it, was he? Right. And Christ told him to he'll trust his hand to his side. And then he did, he said, my Lord and my God. Mm -hmm. he, Thomas calls him his God there. And even when Jesus was in the womb, Elizabeth Christ Mary is the mother of my Lord. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that Mary is mother of God, as the Catholics teach. Right. But she did have a special position to carry the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus is both Lord and God. And you can, we can be sure of that. If he is not, then really the scriptures are untrue, aren't they? Right. Well, I don't profess to be able to explain how all it works between the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. They have their own roles, I guess you could say it that way. You know, the, the Father is sitting on the throne and Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And one day it says he will, that Christ will rule and reign from 
throne of David in Jerusalem. It says, you shall reign until the last enemy shall be defeated, which is death. Amen. But to, to say that Jesus was a created being is to reduce him down to really nothing more than you and I or the angels. Right. Well, that's exactly what the, the Mormons teach. They teach that he was Michael the Archangel. Right. But we see we see Jesus all throughout the Old Testament, even a few places where he, he appears to be, show up in incarnate fashion, if you will. I mean, the three were in the furnace of fire. We see that, that the Son of God, uh, Jesus, was there walking with them. We've seen other places where the angel of the Lord appeared unto some, and that where he possibly could have been Christ himself. Mm -hmm. But I think even more so, we see in creation when he said, Let us make man our image after our likeness. We see all three persons of the Godhead there. Which kind of leads us to our, our next point about God. It says, a study found that 59% of Americans believe the Holy Spirit is a force, but not a personal being. Mm. Well, that's troubling to me that so many Americans don't believe that the Holy Spirit is a, a person, therefore, he must not be a person of the God. Mm. We see in Matthew 28, verse 19, he tells us to you know, go forth and teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. That Christ himself puts the Holy Spirit on the same equal plane field with the Father Amen. and the Son. I'll turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And Paul is concluding his letter to the Corinthians here. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Notice he says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the communion or fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Amen. You can't fellowship with the force, can you? That's it. No, the Holy Spirit is the one we can fellowship with. As other scriptures tell us we can breathe the Holy Spirit. We can quench the Holy Spirit. He's very much a person of the God. Mm -hmm. so, Genesis 1 2 tells us that. When God creates the heavens and the earth, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters of the earth. And then what I quoted as a minute ago, verse 26 tells us that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That it was not just a, God is not just a singular being, he is plural in his essence, if you will. And he is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Well, we are not saying that he is polytheistic, that he is not multiple gods, but he is one God and three persons. Amen. Yeah, I don't know. Americans believe have such a light view of God because of just because they are unsaved. And mm -hmm. An unsaved person can't have a right view of God. Right. Or I'd say a lot of it is also from a lack of knowledge of the scriptures, even among professing Christians. Mm -hmm. Does the scriptures testify that who God is, who Christ is, who the Holy Spirit is? And without a right knowledge of them, we would do just like the Sadducees in there, not knowing the scriptures. Amen. Well, there's plenty of other places that speak of the Holy Spirit and in a way that he must be a person. He came, he descended upon Christ as a, like a dove at his baptism. He came down like a fire and yeah, described as a mighty rushing wind when the uh, apostles were assembled there on the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Certainly he is forceful, but he is not just a, a force. Right. To be born again is to be born again of the Spirit. John chapter 3 tells us. He must be born of water and the Spirit, he says. Well, just as water is a literal thing, so is the Spirit. Yet, that's exactly how the 
Messianic Jew types, the Hebrew roots movement, as some of them call themselves, they they first deny the personhood of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and eventually, all the ones I've seen, they eventually deny the deity of Christ. Mm -hmm. And without Christ, we are of all men most miserable, aren't we? Amen. Without what Christ has done for us, we have no hope. We see the vast, or at least the majority of Americans today have a, a corrupt view of who God really is. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not place to blame on just man. It's also, I think, our fault as his people and we don't proclaim him like we ought to. Mm -hmm. you know, time sake, we'll go ahead and go on though. The next topic I want to look at is what Americans believe regarding sin. There were two uh, reassuring things that Americans believe. They do believe that, or at least the majority of Americans still believe that abortion is sin. The majority of Americans believe that sexual relations outside of a traditional marriage is sin. Even though not, not by a large majority, but, but yet it's Quoting only 42% of Americans believe that the Bible's condemnation of homosexual behavior applies today. Mm. We have a very light view of sin, don't we? Right. Amen. Jude, verse 7, tells us that Sodom and Gomorrah were, and the cities around about them, who suffered the punishment of eternal fire. And they are an example, even for us today. Yeah. But even if you don't want to believe, well, so, well, that was just the Old Testament. That's just, you might say, well, that doesn't matter today. God doesn't have such a harsh view of sin today. We turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And this, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. It says, Know ye not? that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. We won't even address the effeminate, but the abusers of themselves of mankind is the sodomites. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. I mean, if you want... I believe in the, in the Greek, it literally is men and men together. <laughs> that these will not inherit the kingdom of God, it says. Mm -hmm. But neither will these other either fornicators, adulterers, idolaters, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. So God has not turned a blind eye to Sodom or homosexual behavior, you want to call it that. Amen. Sin is still very much a sin in the sight of God. Amen. I don't, I don't think there's levels of sin with God, but he does specifically call the sin of sodomy an abomination in his sight. Amen. But going on from that, he... <clears throat> This one was one of the more troubling ones. I think I mentioned it last week in my message. 70% of Americans believe everyone is born innocent in the eyes of God. Mm. Is everyone born innocent? I, I think we've seen very clearly in Romans that's not the case. Amen. Romans chapter 5. I'll turn there and read a couple of verses for us. Romans 5 verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, so death passed on all men for all of sin. Go ahead. If you drop down to verse 18, it says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the fruit of gift came upon all men, the justification of the life. When Adam, we all became sinners, and Adam, we all came under condemnation. Amen. Well, I don't know if God has a special covenant or an old testified word, but it's 
special covering for the, the aborted babies and such. But I do know all men are born sinners inside of God. Amen. What in Psalms 58, verse 3, those the wicked are estranged from the womb when they go forth from as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Mm -hmm. Man begins to speak lies very shortly after he's born. Amen. Job chapter 11, verse 12 tells us that man is born as a, a wild ass, is called us. Mm -hmm. Rebellious and uncontrollable. That is an apple state of man. Mm -hmm. And if you think, I know babies a lot, they seem real innocent, but it doesn't take very long when that rebellious nature comes out of them. Yeah. You're mad. Well, I don't, I said I don't profess to know. I know David said you know, his child that was, that died, he said he, it could not come to him, but he could go to it. Mm -hmm. So, but I do know that we are not born innocent in the sight of God. Amen. We are all under that sin nature that we inherited from Adam. As we saw very, very clearly, I think Romans 5.18 tells us that judgment came upon all of the condemnation. That doesn't leave out any, does it? That's right. Well, only Christ was born, not of the seed of Adam. Only, only Christ is the one who was born without the sin nature. Well, then all of us are born already in condemnation before God. Amen. Uh, we'll come back up here when we get to the end of our lesson today. We're going on from there. It's a next. Uh, Studies show that 60% of Americans believe everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. Mm -hmm. well, we just saw that everyone is already born a sinner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think Romans chapter 3 puts it very clearly what man is by nature. Right. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. Here Paul is quoting from a couple different Psalms. Psalms 14 is one, Psalms in Psalm 53, which are basically identical, and another one. I forget the other Psalm, maybe Psalm 58. So here, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. Amen. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used to see, the poison of acid is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Yeah. So that is the natural state of man. And yes, he is, verse 9 tells us that he is speaking of all men in general here. He says, What, what then are we better than they? No and no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Amen. Then he goes on to describe the depravity of man in those next nine verses. That man is depraved by nature. He's not seeking after God. He's not seeking to do good. He's not seeking righteousness. In fact, we're full of wickedness by nature. And yet, Amen. You can be sure that most people are not good by nature. Most people, in fact, I would say there is none good, no, not one. The scriptures say that there is none that do with good, there is none that seek it after God. That doesn't leave out any of us, does it? Right. It doesn't say that most don't understand, or some don't understand. He says there's none that understand it. Maybe that. He doesn't say there is some righteous. And he says there's none righteous, no, not well, not even one single individual aside from Christ is righteous. In the Amen. Yeah. I'm not going to turn to these, but Matthew 19, verse 17, Mark 18, to Mark 10, verse 18, Luke 18, verse 10, all tell the same account of the one that came to him and said, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What did Christ respond to him? He said, Why callest thou me good? There is one good but God. 
Mm -hmm. Only God is good. Amen. And only, we can only be good to the person of Christ. By nature, man is not good. There's a lot of moral and upright people in this world. Amen. There's a lot of people who, who strive to do good works. But naturally speaking, man is a sinner in the sight of God. And I think we have too light of or too light of view of sin and too high view of ourselves as Americans. Mm -hmm. but here's the last one I want to just to look at. Only 25% of Americans believe that the smallest sin deserves eternal damnation. Mm -hmm. This really highlights, I think, our, our very light view of sin. Mm -hmm. we have a light, when we have a light view of sin, we'll have a light view of the Savior as well. Mm -hmm. But Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4 tells us the soul of sin of it shall die. Mm -hmm. Romans 6, 23 tells us the wage of sin is death. James 1, 15 tells us that Sin, when it is finished, bring it forth to us. Amen. I think we see very clearly that death is the result of sin. Mm -hmm. We even saw that in Romans 5 there. That death passed on all, for all of sin. And you might say, well, yeah, we're, that's only for the really bad sins, is what some people might say. Mm. James 2, verse 10, I think, makes a very personal, doesn't it? I'm going to turn and read it. I can't quite. I'm going to quote it all. So James chapter 2, verse 10. He says, For whosoever shall be the whole law, and yet offend at one point, he is guilty of all. Mm -hmm. Even breaking the smallest of commandments makes us guilty of the whole thing. That's probably one reason why people don't like the book of James very much. Besides, mm -hmm. it, besides its emphasis on works, but it, that makes us all guilty in the sight of God, doesn't mm -hmm. it? It makes us all no better than the most wicked of sinners. And we like to think of hell as reserved for people like Hitler and Saddam Hussein and mm -hmm. just the most wicked of men. The problem is we are all fully guilty of breaking the law of God. Amen. God doesn't grave sin on a curve. That's it. Say, well, yeah, Hillary, he was a real bad guy, but you were only a little bit bad. So you, we'll go ahead and let you pass. Mm. So if we break even the least of the commandments, we might as well broke the worst of them. Revelation 21. I'll we'll turn there and read this scripture for us. Here we see sinners are cast in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. Chapter 20 speaks of the uh, great white throne judgment there at the end of the chapter. But here in verse number 80 gives some of the people that are cast in the lake of fire. So the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the warmongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of burnings with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Amen. You see here very clearly that sinners are cast in the lake of fire. <laughs> In fact, if you, go, if you go back to chapter 20, verse 15, it says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. the, the real problem isn't that whether you're a big sinner or a little sinner, it's whether you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or not. Mm -hmm. Go to Matthew chapter 25. Let's look at a few, a few verses that I think will make this clear. Matthew 25, those verse 32 and 33, first these, here he says, well, let's go to read verse 31 as well. It says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall 
and gather all nations, and you shall separate them one from another as a sheep, or as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And you shall set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on the left. You bad. We see in the next several verses what matters is whether you're a sheep or a goat. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and drop down to verse 41. He addresses the goats here. He says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, and ye curse, and everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked and clothed me not, sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they answer, then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, did not minister to thee. Amen. Then, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, as much as ye did not to one of the least of these, ye did not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment with the righteous and the life eternal. Amen. Well, so the things he lists there weren't big sins, were they? He said, he, he didn't feed me when I was hungry. He didn't give me a drink when I was thirsty. He didn't clothe me when I was naked. So we, we often think of sin as the big things. And idolatry, and murder, adultery, those type of things. Mm-hmm. So we know that just transgressing the law of God, that is sin. Amen. To know to do good, to do it not, that is sin. Mm -hmm. when, what made the difference here was whether they were goats or sheep, whether they were the righteous or the wicked. These shall go away in the everlasting punishment of the righteous into life eternal. We know that only a person can only be righteous in the sight of God through the person of Christ. Mm -hmm. We saw very clearly there in Romans 3 that there is none righteous, no, not one. And if it was fair and just, if it was on our own merit, we would all be in that group that goes away into everlasting punishment. Mm -hmm. Right, John chapter 3, verse 18. I think here is the other key to man's condition. John chapter 3, verse 18. And we all, everyone knows John 3, 16. But they leave off the rest of the chapter. Right. It says in verse 18 of John 3, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen. So your, your unbelief is what ultimately condemns you. Mm -hmm. It's not that you're going to stand before God and He's going to go down a checklist and say, well, your good works outweigh your bad works. No, naturally, you're already condemned because you don't believe in the name of the Son, of, the only Son of God. Amen. You are already going to say condemned in the sight of God, even if you're a quote good person. Even if you think yourself to be doing lots of good, if you don't believe uh, on Christ, you're condemned already. Amen. And Second Thessalonians, we're going to close with this verse. Second Thessalonians tells us the end of all those who don't believe on Christ. Second Thessalonians chapter one. It says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, all the unbelievers, all those who believe not on the name of the only begotten Son of God. He said, You shall come. A flaming fire taking vengeance on them. Moses, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. Amen. 
it's hard for us to comprehend everlasting destruction, but I know the scripture says it will be everlasting. It will be eternal destruction. And he, even as they're from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. Well, I don't know what those in the lake of fire will be able to know and experience and see, but it describes a place where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Amen. Hey, the presence of the Lord is not there. You don't even get to. You're also forever away from the glory of his power, as it says here. Right? You don't even get to behold his glory. But that is the end state of all who don't believe. All those who, as it says here, obey not the gospel, know not God. You need to know God and to know His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the most important thing to know. Amen. So it all we see very clearly from this study here that Americans don't think themselves to be too bad off, do they? Right. Americans, even including professing Christians, have a pretty light view of sin. Mm -hmm. We can be sure God is going to cast all those who are wicked in his sight into the lake of fire one day. Mm -hmm. Fear not them which destroy the body, but fear him which destroy both body and soul in hell. Christ Amen. And fear not them which Kill the body, but fear him which after he killed you have power to cast in hell. Yes, and you fear him. One of the gospels words it. No plea to Christ, he is our only hope. Amen. Christ was not just some good teacher, he was God himself. Yet, <clears throat> and yet God himself died for his people. He died while we were yet sinners. Romans chapter 5 tells us that while we had sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. and Christ came in the world to save sinners, whom I am chief, Paul says. The truth of the matter is that all are sinners in the sight of God and all need Christ. Mm -hmm. You can think yourself to be good, you can think yourself to be innocent, you can think yourself to be a pretty good person, but yet. This is the end. Everlasting destruction is the end for all those that don't know Christ to save. Amen. For, well, I don't know how much people in Lake of Fire will be able to know of God by knowing they stand before Him at the great white throne and it says that they will flee from His presence. Mm -hmm. So at that time, recognize God for who He really is. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Christ, Jesus Christ is the Lord. For many, it will be too late. Mm -hmm. Close with that thought, we'll, we'll, we'll look at what Americans believe about church and worship and about the Bible next time. Amen.